Okay, let's start. Our next. Okay. <laughs> it works. Well, it's one. So one. our next speaker is um, uh, VP of Special Projects from Wargaming, Gavin Longhurst, and I think this person has done almost anything in the industry. So he was working in uh, um, graphics development, robotics, uh, animation production. Uh, broadcast uh, and so on. So he has vast experience and background that will help us today to try to foresee the future of various uh, kinds of uh, uh, spectator concepts, streaming, esports, and all of that. Warm welcome. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to foresee foresee the future. Uh, thank you for that delightful introduction. Is the audio okay for everybody? Just uh, yep. Excellent. So today I'm going to be talking about um, the future of spectating or some of the futures of spectating. Um, I spent a lot of time in the last few years uh, working inside Wargaming on aspects of how people consume non-real-time or non-interactive game, um, game imagery. I'm going to uh, define that as well. So uh, here's a memory. When we talk about spectating, we're talking about broadcasting something and receiving something or viewing something. Here's a broadcast from uh, 150 odd years ago, in-game screenshot of uh, 1865 St. Petersburg. So much of what human beings um, consume these days is video. It's this image, visual, but it's moving. Uh, hopefully in color and hopefully at uh, higher definitions. Um, I've spent a lot of time again inside Wargaming working on um, how best to maximize brand or the reach of your game title, in our case, things like World of Warships, built here in sunny St. Petersburg, uh, a World of Tanks, and World of Warplanes. So we have those military-related uh, products. We're also shipping other game titles. Um, and I, I, when I think about how to maximize the message or how to produce the message uh, for the most number of people, you have to cut the world up into screens. So whether they're mobile devices, big televisions, the gaming console screens, tiny little LCD ones on the front of the microwave, whatever screen you can reach has some level of monetizable value to you. The wider the screen reach of your, your product, whether it's uh, the number of platforms your game is able to be played on, which is key if you're making most of your money from, those, uh, from that real-time play, or the maximum number of screens that you could potentially reach with spectating or broadcast uh, information. So a, a stream, uh, user videos, um, live streams, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that um, it's so important to talk about streaming and broadcast is that video is very, very powerful. It has enormous screen reach. We as game developers, when we're making stuff, there tends to be, especially among the client team guys, uh, an incredible bias into doing stuff in real time. You always want to be doing stuff in real time. It's about how much can I squeeze out of this chip? How much can I squeeze out of this operating system? How much time have I got? Generally measured in, in frame slices. And that's the same in uh, if audio or AI or any other piece of the puzzle that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to uh, build into the game. The more time you have, typically, either lazier your coding can be the more you can, you can grab from uh, that hardware. But video, the power of video is that there are entire economies completely separate to video games, completely separate to mobile gaming, completely separate to console gaming. There's an entire ocean of devices from a cheap Chinese television to an expensive Chinese television, uh, and, and every screen in between from watches to mobiles that have video built in, hardwired into the DNA of, of that object. The screens we build worldwide are built to vend video, which is not to say that's the only way you can do it, but once stuff is turned into, it turned into MPEG, AVI, whatever, you have the ability to hop across those ecosystems and reach the largest number of screens. If you're trying to do it with your own downloader because you've invented this special file format for this thing, and yes, it's better for these other five reasons, you've then got to go and customize that client, right? Which is why Netflix is like, okay, we've done this investment, but now we've got this enormous reach. There's an enormous number of screens that can support Netflix. There's a big enough screens probably that can support YouTube. 
Um, these are huge platform pushes, and now we have the ability as game developers or as content creators to reach those screens. And everybody wants you to do it. They're not always clear about why or how profitable it's going to be. You're generally, when you get the bill, always clear about how much it costs you to do, right? So, um, you know, Facebook wants a piece of you. I presume by now, Vcontact wants a piece of you as well. If you're in Korea, the, the vendor is Africa, if you're a Chinese vendor, again, everybody wants your content. And they want the content because the audiences themselves are, are moving around, especially younger audiences who are more technologically adept and have uh, fear viewing consumption habits. But as you can see here, a, a huge game in the space, uh, uh, a huge franchise, a huge publisher in the space is adopting these um, new modalities of how to sustain, engage uh, with audiences. So a very important person in the gaming scene, Barbara Streisand, uh, famously said, memories light the corners of my mind, misty watercolored memories of the way they were. It was right after she took uh, two back-to-back -back wins in player under battlegrounds. Um, memories are monetizable. Video is monetizable. There's entire industries, uh, corporations, Zaibatsu's made out of mountains of video. And we as game developers can ignore that at our peril, or we can try and harness it. What I'm showing you here, uh, how do we play? Let's try, oop, oop. Uh, I have no idea how the play function works on this, do we know? Is it, just click, uh -huh. So, <coughs> Who here is an, uh, a Radeon person or an NVIDIA person? H hands up if you're an NVIDIA person. Anybody use NVIDIA on their PC? Two whole people, three people. It must be a console country. You're all Radeon guys, right? Right, right. Okay, so this is neither. This is an embedded repo of uh, a trip just after uh, GDC this year with my wife who's driving a car. Uh, and there's a rather tragic end for a wallaby, which is a small uh, Australian marsupial, a small of a kangaroo. In about one minute, you'll uh, almost die. Um, I'm showing you this video because, A, it's entertaining. My wife is driving, as I said, and I'm really proud of her reaction, which was, uh, oh, is this it? I'm not sure. Oh, God, there it is. Um, so I can't move the camera to show you that that cute marsupial wallaby is right. And my wife didn't kill it, all right? And you have to take my word that she didn't kill it because I put my head around and, and looked at it. Um, it did survive, but I'm locked in, in terms of this memory or me sharing this, this high-resolution visual with you by the technology of my age, all right? I didn't spring in March 2017 for the extra 360 wraparound and coolio camera with the high definition that would give me a rear camera view as well. Or I didn't hotwire my rental car facing camera to give me that rear view. As game developers, if we're dealing with a 3D game, I'm going to leave the 2D guys to one side. So all of you mobile 2D guys, your problems are solved. It's easy, right? But the 3D guys, you, you don't have to be locked by this tradition. Now, this is a $150 GPS with, with a camera built. It's built on mountains of patents and technologies that have nothing to do with video gaming. But the principle of what it's trying to do is the same. It's trying to project you, project through me an image uh, a movie of what happened in time, that fragment, that memory. And as game developers in 3D, we don't have to be constrained by 105 degree field of view, right? Or 100 degree or 98 degree. We don't have to be if we don't care about how real time it is, which is why I keep talking about video versus real time, making this, this key distinction. Because doing stuff in real time is cool, okay? It's fundamentally why a huge chunk of this audience, I suspect, gets up and goes to day to see how much they can shave into that six milliseconds they get for the lighting pass. And I completely respect that. I've spent most of my life trying to enable that. My world, worst, worst words in my lexicon are like 8-bit, right? My childhood was 8-bit. It's powered by my imagination, but, and I, I get who like it because it's retro and stuff, but you're all half my age, all right? They, back then, 8-bit was something, uh, when will it improve? When will we get 16-bit? More color more definition, more pixels. Making games was a lot easier on 8 in some ways. Um, but yeah, more color, more definition, pixels. 
is where the human eye wants to go. And I'm putting this up because Jerry Lewis is a, a fan favorite of mine, especially as a kid. I loved his work. And he died a few weeks ago. One thing he did, and he was, uh, before he got an Academy Award for this, I don't think he was the first, uh, having researched it a little bit, but he was certainly one of the first major uh, innovators and commercializers the technique of putting a camera inside or next to the camera he was shooting film on. So when he was making his larger films, he was the first guy in the mid-50s, late-50s, to, uh, at, at his kind of grade of filming, um, adopt this technique and be able to put a real-time camera, a television camera, next to a film camera. So he wouldn't have to wait hours or, or more usually days to get the rushes back. When he was trying to do a stunt where he skipped and fell over, you don't want to wait three days to work out if you go back to the set and re shot. So he paired a video, a television camera, to give him real-time feedback. Right? There's a lot of revolutions happening right now uh, in, in the world of gaming, in the world of broadcast, in the world of technologies. And, uh, you know, 60-odd years ago, he wasn't held back uh, by thinking about how to change the processes or take advantage of the processes of modern technology, and neither should we. Memory, memories are monetizable, especially if you've got a long IP. World of, World of Tanks is, what is it, seven years old now? Something like that? Okay, so we, we're, obviously it's in our best interest to keep that behemoth going. But it's, it's rare that in the game's IP that you have an opportunity to reinvent yourself continuously or to pivot from, we're making one title and in three years when that dies, we'll move on to the next title. We're in a, an age now where we're talking about IPs lingering, potentially for decades. How do we, do, how do we keep up with the Joneses? How do we reach out and maintain those audiences? The future part of that is spectating, is finding those audiences. And it turns out as leisure time increases, as people get more and more time uh, coming into their pockets that they can spend at their discretion, um, we're going to have a larger audience. There are more people with more time per capita than there were a while ago. But you're also competing against all those screen types and all of those types of hobbies. And it gets even harder when we're talking about new technologies, new screen types. I still think of a, a 360 or a VR appliance or a, an AR to some extent, a, a new screen. It's a new destination. The caveat with those, of course, is that they are harder to produce content that looks as good as a single screen. Because typically what you're trying to do is hit many times uh, uh, more difficult to achieve uh, with the same rendering power that you have locally, whether it's a, a console or a phone. Um, these are problems. Now, this clip is only 10 minutes long, and that sounds like a long time, so I'm going to fill it with noise. This is my second chicken dinner. I can't, my first chicken dinner, which was a better kill. Does anybody know what a, a chicken dinner is? Just raise your hand if you played Player Unknown Battlegrounds. I'm not talking to a, the game, 100 people jump onto an island and they fight each other, and then one person walks away. And at the moment, there are 19 people left, and I'm a on tens of square kilometers of, of this island trying to survive. And a couple of things about this is a broadcast experience. So you know, user, as a, as a watcher, a consumer, a spectator, in the day of screen, especially if you're younger than me, the first thing you want to do is move the camera. You want to be able to touch that screen and move it around. And for reasons uh, that are some to do with gameplay balancing, like you don't want eyes in the back of your head. But after the event, why don't you want you know, eyes at the back of your head? Why don't you want to reveal that or have a cam? I want to be able to move around, right? I can understand why you want to lock that information from the player so you're not having game balancing issues and, and assist issues and these kinds of things. Ways around that. If this was an AI game on today's technology, if this was artificial intelligence, was my enemy, other people, it wouldn't matter that the spectator is moving the camera around because there's nobody to put in jeopardy by this extra assistance. Um, so we're limited as well, and this is crucial, and this goes to the greater philosophic, philosophical uh, point I'll, I'll get towards the end, the end of the presentation. Um, this is, I think, a 1080p down from my 2K capture, if that's not too juggling. For so it's a high definition. I did it on a laptop, a $3,000 laptop, which, you know, Wargaming bought for me. Thank you, Wargaming. Um, who here has a $3,000 laptop? Just raise your hands. 10 people, I'm going to say. Who has a, a more, $3,000 or more laptop? No? Nobody. Okay. 10, 10 people in the audience have an expensive laptop. So everybody, if 
Earlier, we'll get to this screen in a moment, the, 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 the hardware list in Steam. Everyone seen the hardware list in Steam? This many people have this many cards of this X12, OPGL. So, here's the Most people don't play it when it looks this good. And it could look slightly better than this, actually. It's a new, it's a new game. It's still in beta. It's got some, some uh, room left to push some stuff. Uh, I'm running on a laptop, so it's not as fast frame rate wise maybe as my big desktop. But also, when I'm encoding it at time. When I'm, I'm running an MPEG encoder in the back, either on the hardware or through some software process, I'm chewing up more processing power from wherever the, the machine can spare it. It's the, the video buffer, the, the CPU, the RAM, uh, the fan spinner. It works a little harder and it, it grabs this and it creates this broadcast that you see. But only the best, sorry, not the best, only the most expensively equipped, the people with the most expensive laptops, the most expensive computers, can make an image in real time that looks at least this good. Who here thinks that's a great way to run a democracy? Nobody? Who here thinks that's a great way to produce art? Let's say for a moment that the games, we can argue about whether or not games are art now, but they, they are certainly neighboring technologies to what uh, art distribution and art creation are going to be in the digital world, whether that's pushing it to some form of Instagram or pushing it to some art form or a VR experience, landscape, whatever it is. Game technologies are, the, are in the sister space of stuff that will be known as art going forward. And the mechanisms, the transport mechanisms, how we get that from my computer and my brain, my experience to you, is over the internet, and it's hardware that you have to hand. And this is where the whole thing is busted, in my opinion. The whole thing is busted because only the rich kids can make art that looks high quality, high frame rate, best texture, most detail, Best, best highlights, most, and I'm talking the best by like the top 10%, if that 15% for a leading edge game. That's not to say that there isn't art in simple lines or a cartoon or a sketch. That's completely valid. But having studied the human eye for a long time or been around people who've been studying the human eye and understanding how advertising works and understanding how moving graphics work, if it is given a crudely compressed bad detail version by setting it on fire and jumping out a window. Or you have a 4K version of PewDiePie setting it on fire and jumping out of, of a window. Most eyeballs will be drawn to the higher quality one if the device can support it. There are caveats about that. You know, which device? Um, like a, a matter of convenience. It doesn't matter for most people's eyeballs if the thing is 4K when it's a foot and a half away from your face. A, uh, on, a, on a small phone, but it does if it's on a bigger screen. So I can see you're all entranced. I'm just going to move past it now. I'll, I'll let you watch it. Um, my heart is in my mouth, obviously. There's, there's an enormous amount of tension. I've been alive for know, half an hour or something. Twelve people left. I'm missing because I'm so nervous. Being to slip. It's all very, very tense. And my ability to project this tension to you is, again, because I have that ability to code a high resolution, a much nicer version, not a postage stamp version. I had enough bandwidth at the time to be able to up if I, if I was actually did this offline and then streamed it up. Again, this is one of the problems. Who here works in mobile versus computer? Who here works in mobile gaming, phone gaming? Anyone? Raise your hand. I'm going to say another 10, 15 people. OK. All right, so working in mobile, if you upload an experience, that is using the frame buffer of your device, and it's something this complicated, and you're trying to use the 3G or 4G or 5G at the same time, you're going to run out of heat and cycles, OK? The, the, the phone is going to throttle down. The internet will get choked. The thing will, will, will get very warm in your hands, and it will become, become uh, uncomfortable or, or unplayable after a while. Games with less graphical uh, overhead uh, uh, may have some methods of encoding that are simpler. but if I wanted to project, for instance, uh, a kill cam behind me, a 360 camera, so that when you next look at this, you could turn the video around. When it was a week later, it doesn't really matter to anybody. I can't do that on a, I can't even do that on my PC, because I'd be asking my PC to, to fold more video than I can do in real time. So I'm, I've been starting to think for a while now, a couple of years now, that we've got to look at alternatives. 
There are some alternatives out there that are being shopped around. Um, this book, for instance, has a, uh, a novel method of doing uh, like a cube, uh, a cubic reflection app kind of to, uh, getting a 360 uh, video going. But it, it needs a lot of hardware as well. Probably won't work on phones. But it's an interesting approach, at least trying to do something useful. Um, for those who haven't seen this kind of gameplay, if I'm outside of the blue, I'm taking damage and eventually I'll die. So I've got to stay inside the blue and it's a constant cat and mouse game. So there's other companies like uh, uh, Genvid. Genvid is here actually, they're giving a talk same time, same room tomorrow. Here, it's all about spectating a and Genvid's approach is, is also interesting. They're saying, of the people in this room, there will be a subset that want to interact with a spectating stream. At which point, having things like depth information, the ability to select objects or scenes or groups or sets, being able to touch units, getting into that area where you're saying, it's real time, reward the player. I want to reward the character. I want to impair the other team. I want to prevent something from happening. I want to give me a... A chicken dinner assist by dropping a, a nice kit. I hope I don't swear at the end of this clip. I haven't actually tested it, so I don't know. Um, there's a lot of tension, as you can see. It's all stored up. And, and what you want to do, and where most streaming is aiming towards, is to engage and entertain, right? So make a lot, a lot of noise at eSports. Because eSports is something that, that companies Active groups of people who are engaged in creative arts, like ourselves, and game, can understand and can put into a group. It's taken us 10 years to get to the point where we can understand it. I don't think the guy even at the end knew where I was. And I didn't realize I was out of the blue as well at this point, or almost about to be out of the blue. Um, I told you the answer, of course, if, if I'm telling the truth, that I survived this round, but did I? And the answer is yes, I wouldn't be showing one and I got killed. There's too many of those to choose from. Um, so we make a lot of noise about esports. And that's because it's a broadcast that we can channel into previously understood pieces like TV, audience, sport. OK, we're going to have this sport dynamic. We can talk about large numbers of people. All right? But we're not doing anything to the broadcast to improve the broadcast. We're not saying, oh, we've got 50,000 people watching this one video. We can make a better video because we've got a, a multiplier of, of audience observation, right? If it's one person watching, you're watching your brother's video, that's one dynamic. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, a one-to-one family. Yeah. Boom. There it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you for that one. That's great. Um, so eSports... Esports we think a lot about in, in large numbers, all right? And it's, it's something that, that companies can do, but esports is a pebble in the ocean of streaming. Most streams about people you care about, whether they are celebrities, people that are famous, the PewDiePie's of the world that you want to see on screen, or friends, it's, it's more likely to be friends. So while we absorb an awful lot of uh, content um, from esports activities, uh, we are also generating much, much more content among friends. And this is where the real telling relationship is. You've heard about, uh, about new recommendation economies or something like that. That is where it doesn't matter about the advertising these days in print. It, it matters about like whether or not your friend recommended it, whether, whether that celebrity recommended it, whether your mother recommended that game to you. But in almost all of these cases, when you look at it, the, the transport system, the telegraph, the mechanism by which they notified you of that cool game, that player unknown battle, Thanks, or that other Warcraft, is generally by a video. Sometimes it's a blog post, yes, sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a slap on the back of the head, but you're either walking past the screen and you're seeing it, in which case you're spectating a local event, or you're being notified through some method. And I'm stating that the, the crummier your looks, the more sophisticated your art style and the higher end it is to render, and the crummier it looks because it was badly encoded, is going to literally impair your revenue and your ability to keep that game alive and keep all those people engaged and happy. So I think longer term that once we start this arms race, and it really is an arms race, that once that, that balloon goes up and you say, OK, we're not going to be beholden just to what we can do in real time, but it's the whole enchilada. It's the whole package. It's what we can do at runtime and how good we can make the video look afterwards. So our appetites are getting bigger and broader.
time, our ability to consume media is, is never going to stop, as far as I can see. There's a number of ways to monetize something like uh, this that we've done so far. Things like uh, esports events, merchandising. You've got all these other secondary economy systems other than the, the in-game merchandise. But the area that, that I really want to get into, the, what I want to touch on, is to solve this problem, which is the people with the most money and the most hardware are the only ones that get to broadcast, which is an ugly way of thinking about the future. I think we've got to disinherit ourselves of crappy business systems. So in games, if any of you are in the business side of games, you've probably heard the number 30% a few times in your life. 30% came from maybe the music industry. A lot of music guys came into games in the early days in the 80s and brought that number with them, which was a big 30% of your revenue went to the distribution platform or process that got that name out there, got that game out there. There is no reason to drag that reptile from its prehistoric past and put it on a future platform. And so instead of basically making, I'm not trying to upturn YouTube or upturn Twitch or upturn Panda TV or any of these guys, I'm trying to make better content in our games to go to these platforms, to make us money and engagement and enhancement and, and, and enthusiasm for the games. And I think the way to do that is to think about how we make a game replay slightly differently, or this, the future of spectating slightly different. <laughs> there will be an enormous number of people forever going forward who will be older but still want to play games, hopefully. At least that's, that's where I'm going, definitely. That's Matthew McConaughey. You all know him. Great T-shirt. Um, things are very, very, very complex in gaming, especially in 3D. And if you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to have a real-time version that I play on my Xbox or on my, phone or on my PC, but I'm going to take the same game replay file, which is a much smaller file format, probably of the telemetry of what happened in the game, and I'm going to spend more time on more particles, more anti-aliasing, just the basic stuff, right? You can go further into the physics or mesh density or specular reflection or the lighting model, how many photons you, you elect to, to drench on a modern uh, game asset. That's a whole future conversation we can talk about. And I have a whole other talk on that as well. But uh, just the basics, being high resolution. And by high resolution, I don't mean like 720p, which works on a, say, 2K. I mean like 4K, like 8K. Like why not talk about bending, where possible, the camera format. So there is a camera pointing backwards. There's a 280 degree hemispheres. The 360 perfect seamless camera that generates the awesome image that we all want to see at our leisure after the event, as long as it doesn't impair your ability to play the game. And so uh, NVIDIA and ourselves did some work uh, earlier. Uh, and we've done some work even ourselves in various branches across the company to try and look at what that would be like. Um, so you say to yourself, I am making an image that is going to be rendered offline after the event. I'm going to take the same game. I'm going to put this replay through something. you can. You can get something very, very close to the future of spectating. If you're making a 360 image like this one, which is an alpha, pre-alpha monster broken image, right? It's played out, but it would work in VR, which means that if you're watching this replay, just as we're watching the 10 minutes when I move that screen, you can move your head or move the screen. You can position it any way you want to look. And the cool thing, and why it's affordable, and why the if spectating is, is on the, the platter here, is that if this costs a certain amount to render. Let's say it costs, round figures, 10 cents per replay, okay, of, of plant equipment, somewhere in the server, somewhere in the cloud. It's certainly advantageous to, to me as, as a publisher, as a, as a service provider, to say, okay, this costs 10%, 10 cents. I'm going to give you a couple of throws free, but after the couple of throws free, I'm going to make one that's, that's 12 cents for myself so I can pocket two cents with the revenue and build the service out, right? You're able to say, hey, I'm going to be able to give you the perfect replay. No problems with image compression. It'll be the perfect encode. It will be 360, 8K. It'll be 16X anti-aliasing. It'll be the best that game can look, even if you're on the bottom 20% of that Steam hard list. So suddenly, the kid at the bottom, who's got his oldest machine, Windows XP, can't even stream with Windows XP, right? Saves the replay of World of Tanks to the sky, sits in a little box somewhere, and when he's ready to pay for it in, experience, pay for it in gold, that machine ticks over and spits out this video. Here's what's really, really sneaky about that. Once that video is minted, firstly, it's, it's something that 
Facebook wants, it's something that vContact wants, it's something that YouTube wants, Twitch wants it. They want that content. And they want good quality content at the highest resolution possible. The reason they want it at the highest resolution with the best quality is because people prefer to watch better quality stuff. I don't want to get into an argument about whether or not it's uh, an arty, lower res style game is more fun to play. I, I completely agree it probably would be, but spectating is not game playing. Spectating has a completely different pressure zone reinforcement system. It's producing a different brainwave, a, a brainwave set in your head. It's producing a, a different mental state. So the ability to say to a player, and we're all about player happiness, and we try to be at, at, at Wargaming, right? If we just said to the player, hey man, you know how you can't Render a 360 video, now you can. Remember how you can't render a 4K video? Now you can. Remember how you can't uh, have that speculative definition or the leaves on the trees because we have to give you the video version because your machine is so late? Now you can look as good as PewDiePie's output does. That means when you jump that bike over the gorge or you run that off that cliff, you kill that guy, you split him in half with a samurai sword, whatever it was, the kid at the bottom of that rung, my grandmother, for that matter, who has a really dog shit machine, can create visual art or visual output pulls the best a game engine can offer. We can even tilt the scale further on and say, if you give me enough time and enough money, a dollar more, whatever it is, we could give you one that looks even better than the maximum quality of the, of the client. Although that's a little bit invasive, and we have to talk about breaking the client too. But that's basically the gist of the talk. I think I'm almost out of, uh, oh, I've got a few more minutes, okay, almost out of time. So what I would say here is that there are other opportunities for us to make um, complex things that are very, very difficult to do now. Some single digit percentage of the PC gaming audience makes uh, streaming videos now, right? Single digit. This method democratizes that loop. So if you've got some percentage in your marketing plan or some percentage in your customer uh, love pipeline that says this amount of streaming is keeping our game alive, this amount of audience engagement is keeping us alive. If I'm doubling tripling or, or, or making that number tenfold what it is now with this idea, if you're able to do that, it's almost a linear response. Yes, there are different demographics. Yes, there's different economics to that, that population. But you're talking about providing a secondary level economy to all that your game does after you've made your game. And that means money in your pocket. It means a happier player. It means a more enthusiastic community. And it means, obviously, a lot of stuff that people have got to edit, but that's a whole different thing about AI editing and stuff we can get into in another talk. And that's basically what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much. <laughs> future of art. Games and art, the future of art. Any questions for anybody in the audience? There are stickers to be completed, some sort of quest. Anybody? Not a single question. Excellent. Come on, one. Did everyone understand what I was saying? Mr. Dickens. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Gavin, you make an excellent point about the democratization of broadcast, that we can get gameplay linked to the player's integrity and capability, not necessarily their budget mm -hmm. for a graphics card. And I think also there is something in the, the gameplay, particularly in your, your chicken dinner, where the style of the Twitch camera, the style of your point of view that's effective to your play is not great for spec dictatorship. Do you see a, an aspect where the decoupling from the player view and the broadcast view could be quite different or rich? Absolutely. That, what sort of experiences could we expect there, or is that leading into... No, no, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. There's a lot of meat on that bone. Uh, so, first of all, Creating a system that's off-body in the case of like it removes that overhead. Like the, the kids who can't stream literally cannot stream. The, the computers won't run the game and stream at the same time. When you're doing that, when you're looking at something like a mobile game, mobile games at the high end where they're texture rich or very heavy, heavy clients don't talk to Twitch, to YouTube properly. They don't do it because it's almost impossible for anyone but an, a domain expert to get a video image off that phone and to the internet. Right? It's really, really tricky. You've got an emulation. You've got to put a camera behind it. It's a pain in the ass. If you suddenly say to the player, hey, tick this box, and I've just used this API that's like out there, and I can render this for a few coins or a few stars or widgets, suddenly you're, you're, um, you're able to get mobile phones talking to the largest social management appliance for, for marketing and stuff that there is. But 
terms of other experiences that you can generate, yeah. I mean, if, if you get to the point where, for instance, our, our grand finals are in December 2017 in Malta, for anyone who wants to know, our grand finals, um, we've been thinking about the problems around lots of people looking at it. Imagine, if you will, for a moment that, this is another cool thing about video that maybe I, sh I should have emphasized more, is that once you create video once and you make it flexible enough, in this case, a 360 uh, video, a surround video, right? It doesn't matter if one person is viewing it once it's cached and, and like casted and everything else on the internet. One person watches it, that's fine, but it's like, you've all seen that thing where the clown gets into the car and then another clown gets into the car and all these clowns get into the car. As more people get into this video, it gets cheaper to watch. It gets cheaper to render. So if that rendering cost cost me $10 to make this 8K super stellar amazing footprint in the sky, YouTube is holding the cost, right? Facebook is holding the cost of that. The more people that watch it, it's just more money. And, and if you say as well, because Einstein said it best when like um, time is money, equals money, uh, the more people you get watching something, you can accept that the cost of that broadcast, especially for something big like a marquee event, like a, like a World of Tanks premiere or whatever, you can make it more and more real time. You don't have to render it over an hour after the event or two seconds after the event. You can do it in real time. And so as those, all those people get into that viewing room, you can get them to vote, just like they do on those Twitch games where they all crowdsource vote. You could pretend they're all in like a Zeppelin flying above the battlefield and 10,000 people want to move left and the voting system allows them to move the camera left. The camera is paramount. The camera is the most important thing in my universe when I think about what to do with games after real time. You're enabling human behavior to be expressed in the viewing. If I'm watching a sport that I don't want to watch because it's football and it's not my football or whatever, I pick up a remote and change the channel. If I want to watch my friend, but I don't want to watch him from that angle, I want to move the camera. It's driving me crazy that I can't see behind my friend or my, 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 my own action, my own replay. Uh, and again, there are good balancing reasons why you want to do that in absolute real time, but in a, a, a wide theater sense where the whole scene is revealed, like a world, a grand finals of tanks, two teams, the audience sees the entire scene, right? They're not abstracted from seeing the fog of war. There are times when frame is very, very, very important. And so, yeah, the ability to have multiple people looking from different orientations is a function of money. So I can put two cameras in the scene. One that you're driving around, Right? It costs more, but if there's 100 people in it or 1,000 people watching the stream, it, it becomes vanishingly small, the actual cost. Right? Because you have to think about your audience as either driving engagement or driving advertising revenue in some way. And, and, and if you're making the viewing experience, the receipt of that experience, uh, monetizable as well. So you've got the guy who's broadcasting. It costs him or her almost nothing to pull that chain and broadcast that with in-game gold or in-game experience or some sort of in-game loot return for time spent. You could also, theoretically, create a viewer that the more people that are watching a particular cast, the more photons we can drench, the more time we can spend on lighting, lighting it up. This is something that Otoy uh, is talking about doing, at least uh, in the rendering sense, um, for, for, for game assets and, and, and other film assets. So it's a really interesting company as well, Jules Orbach. Uh, any other questions? There'll be more than one question. Please, no. I'll ask myself. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. So if we have the technology for this and we have the games, why aren't we seeing it? In the wargaming sense? Yeah. Um, we've got, the, we've got replays. We've got computers. Well, we've, we've got just passion got replays. Okay, so, 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 yeah. Okay, so, uh, for instance, one of the things that the Sydney team here, just put up your hands, Sydney team. Thank you. Just raise your hands. Thank you. See you here. Have just finished 2017 is authority of server replay. That is a, a combinatorial approach to looking at the entire replay scene. If you just looked at it from the player's perspective before uh, only, it doesn't work in a lot of these use cases. So we've only just got some of the technology pieces in place. That said, there are also enormous cultural differences between um, TV adoption and TV understanding and advertising acceptance between Russia CIS viewers and American viewers. To use an old 2012 statistic, there are approximately four or more televisions per American household. How many are there in the average household in Russia? Anyone? About half a television per household. There is an enormous difference in consumption habits. There's an enormous difference in acceptance of what advertising is. While you not, may not be aware that you're being advertised to in a certain way or using certain mediums, um, 
there is, there is a, a disparity between uh, a, an e economy I can make in the West and an economy I can make here in Russia. That said, this particular idea, and a lot of the reasons I thought about it, I've thought very selfishly about it as a large, privileged, global, multinational games company. Nobody here at, the, at an indie level has the capacity, really, if they're a three-man team or whatever, to go and make a MPEG encoding, worldwide global distribution, Zeppelin filler system, right? But the top 25 game publishers probably do. And uh, pieces of the internet, Facebook, Google, and otherwise, are sort of filling in the gaps towards that. This is something, and I, I mentioned before it was an arms race, not because it's a topical thing to talk about with Rocket Man and Trump at the moment, but because um, once somebody's video looks that much better than you, once everybody has that 4K thing that's coming down at 19 megabits, and it looks like silk, and it looks amazing, and you divorce in your mind that, yes, I know it's not going to look like that at runtime, right? But that's what they're shilling, that's what they're showing, something that looks a lot more like the trailer. That's much more enjoyable to watch than the, than, than the real-time raw feed. Then the race is going to be on. Which means you've got to scramble around and work out a way to match the visuals or otherwise outcompete that. And it is doable. The, reason, the primary reason I think it hasn't been addressed by us or anyone else quite yet is the economics of it, which I did before. And I only really dragged the economics of that in the last few years, and it's been a knocking on doors service trying to get that done, which is to say, I want to get away from advertising. It's the only currency we talk about. I want to get away from um, that 30% deal with YouTube as the only thing we talk about. There are other ways to, uh, to build an economy, and the user pays and user receives uh, economies are a very, very liberating way to think about the engagement. And yes, I know nobody really pays for streaming yet, except they, they, they bloody well do. If you've ever used OBS, right? You want to use OBS Pro, that costs you money. If you're ever trying to upload video, you get to a limit about how much you can express. All right? The, the generation below us, below me anyway, sorry, yeah, is, is nickel and dime about what they're al allowed to uh, upload to a limit. There is a currency about video that is well known and established literally around the, the cost of storage of hard drives and how fast you can throw those bits around the planet. And it's great that we're talking about video because it's never been cheaper to do it and it will increasingly get cheaper to do that. And remember, we're not talking about real time other than the transmission of the, of the video image. We're talking about um, what to do once that moment has passed. But thank you for a great question, sir, whoever you are. Uh, yes, a gentleman in the black. Oh, yes, other gentleman yeah. in blue. Okay, uh, Alexey Golikov, Wargaming, St. Petersburg. I got a question about monetization as well. Um, there is a big culture of uh, moviegoers who like uh, to see uh, big blockbusters like uh, Michael Bay with the great explosions in IMAX format. So we can um, do replace uh, with some uh, as great post-production to create a uh, lot of great effects for these guys to feel like movie stars, to show up this content uh, with their friends and uh, to uh, burst a lot of money into this post-production, uh, not related to the basic gameplay. So is this uh, stuff uh, going to monetize in the future? Efficient? No. I mean, it's not efficient. Well, talking about, so to summarize that question, that's the best way I understand it, are we talking about getting to like Michael Bay levels of, of post-rendering? I'm saying the end of that, of that argument, if you can fuel it, um, a lot of modern games use a technique called physically-based rendering, PBR, right? Almost all of those implementations devolved from a couple of papers about five or six years ago um, that, that devolved and decanted themselves out of experience in the film industry, which is on its own neighboring but always slightly separate trajectory. So there are very, very closely arranged understandings of how film and game rendering technologies work. And game guys excel at cheating, cheating death all the time, about getting as close to this technique as possible without having to actually spend hours or minutes or days offline rendering. And there will always be advantages in time. But the answer is, the cheapest way to do it, I'm a, I'm a low friction guy, I've always tried to do something the sneakiest, with the quickest result, that gives you the, the, the greatest long term, but the, just the basics. Going from 720p, which is all your computer can do, to 4K with 16x anti-aliasing, and full textures, and full particles, and full lighting model, Something that your highest end machine guy is maybe possible to do on launch day, but probably not till it's patched. Just that as a first step, unifying the output of the content, 
Think about like when was the last time you saw a, a, a PC game review that was uh, from a professional PC uh, outfit that had problems that weren't in the engine to begin with, right? They're, they're always trying to do a uniform, uh, high-end machine result, the best the game can look today. That is the, the minimum of this idea, but, but, but effectively, yes. If you start talking about um, assigning a, a, a ruble or a dollar value to the time and plant equipment of up-resing or up-rendering, and you're able to build or, or at least start building new renderers that have the capacity to be rewound, stepped forward and backwards, have no frame-to-frame -frame dependencies, decouple the, the, the GUI, all these kinds of things. If you're able to start thinking about that, then yeah, we're in, a, we're in an area where you can say, I can go to the nth degree uh, about how good it looks in terms of explosions or part of fire. The one caveat there, of course, is that with us, we have some pretty strict rules about uh, our audience, at least this was the rule given to me a few years ago. It can't look, it can look different, it can look better, but it can't look different from the event. So if a tank fired through a window to hit another tank, and I make it look better or higher resolution, the mechanics or the mass of that operation starts to look the same. It can't be offset. So it has to be true to the event. Otherwise, our audiences will walk because I didn't get shot by that guy. It's different to my recollection. I hope that answers your question. If not, we can talk more afterwards. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Gavin. Um, I wonder if there's an informa informational element to this because, in fact, I think you just sort of hinted at it there, is that the user interface that's overlaid to the game so user interface that's overlaid to the game. Um, I can see people who want to watch the video yep. in all its glory yep. without the interface. Some people who want the normal interface. Then some people who want much, much more information because yeah. there's different audiences yeah. who want that. And whether your codec can actually have layers. And would I that I had a team off. to build a codec uh, because it would have flowing heat maps like lava yeah. poured over the landscape and be able. Yeah. But but um, the metadata that we have from. Uh, a game like World of Warcraft, uh, World of Tanks, World of Warcraft, um, the footprints, the digital footprints that each character or, or the treads that a, a tank leaves that you can, you can talk about where it's been. You know where that tank traversed. You can go back and digitally see its footprints. It doesn't matter if the game format, um, once that event has passed, typically the money has been spent on the betting, the, the time has been spent in front of the grand finals, the friends have had their grudge match, the clan match is over, right? In post, that is after the event, meaningfully after the event, it should not matter for most existing games, and I'm pretty sure we could work out design ways to get around it for new games, to be able to uh, enable all manner of uh, rich metadata overlays. Um, and some has to be required. For instance, if we uh, abstract a, a virtual container for, for a, a World of Tanks Blitz, right? We, say, right? we put it in this rack, in this virtual container in, in our cloud, and it's going to render out, even though it's from a crummy low-end Samsung phone, it's going to render out as good as it looks on the high-end PC client, right? still potentially got to say, well, I want to take the, the, the camera from the phone, which is taking the video of the person's face, and cache that right, along with the audio and stitch it together against the timelines in order to create uh, an authentic stream along the lines of the PC titles. At the moment, we don't get a lot of PC streaming from uh, some of our mobile games because some of the mobile games are just too high, and the requirements for, for, for streaming off a phone are too crazy. But if, if everyone believes, and the market has shown to have it work, that Ties response to viewership, right? So that's a known solution for 100 years now, right? More people you have watching something, the more money you're able to get from advertising. So if you just believe in the advertising bit, getting your gameplay to a forum that allows you to access that, that monetization part is crucial. And yeah, things like divorcing the way we think about, you're going to think about maybe GUI more like an alpha layer, right? You can turn it off, or it can be customized, or, um, you know, once you start saying the camera is not going to be a known value all the time, there's all kinds of, of caveats and gotchas you've got to investigate that, that Fibonacci in all manner of directions. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting area for experimentation, nonetheless. Other questions? Thank you, St. Petersburg.